told me today, she said that rain is just watering my grass and it is just growing. And she had liked that she was just so happy that it was growing as fast as it was growing. But I am thankful because God is in control. Right? And sometimes God gives us extra because he knows that you may be going through a drought. And I'm not prophesying anything there. I'm just telling you, sometimes God blesses you with, with a little extra because he knows that you're going to need it later on. So good to have you with us tonight. Will you stand and let's open our service with prayer. Then Brother Ed's going to be leading us in worship tonight through song. I really do appreciate you being with us. And uh, we're looking for God to reach down and touch us. I've heard some wonderful things about last Wednesday night. Brother Rick teaching. And uh, I thank God. You know, he sends me the outline. And I'm thinking, I don't know where he gets all this stuff, but it's good. And uh, I, I appreciate that. But can we just ask God to really reach down and touch us? I, I want God to stir our hearts. I don't want us to just go through the formality of being religious, church attenders. I want God to really do something inside of our heart. Father, as we come before you tonight, I know that, God, we have so many things to be thankful for. You brought us to the house of the Lord tonight. And God, I want to worship you with all of my heart. I, I do, God. I just want to worship you. And Lord, I pray that in this service tonight that our hearts are going to be challenged. Father, I pray the Holy Ghost will challenge us. I pray to God that you'll get a hold of us tonight and not turn loose. God, I am praying, Lord, that we can see that God, the spiritual tide rise in this church because of a, of a hunger for God to get closer and closer to God. Lord, I, I'm praying for a Pentecostal experience that we've not experienced. I'm praying for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. God, that we're not seen with our eyes. But I know that, God, that you're still pouring out your presence and your spirit. God, I just ask you, Lord, to move tonight. And, God, those that have desired to be here but they can't, Lord, you know who they are, those who have been sick. And, God, those that may be in the hospital, those who are in the nursing homes or wherever they may be, God, will you just reach down and touch them tonight. And, Father, we're fair not to give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's turn to page six. I want to know more about my Lord. Tomorrow, my plan 
may be seated. Are you looking for that day? Amen. He's coming for those that are anticipating him. Amen. I think sometimes we get kind of just used to life. We go in in that day, day in, day out. And, um, and we kind of put the promise of God aside and we just kind of forget about it. Don't ever forget about it. You know, this world is pretty much coming unglued on itself because they allow too much of the devil in. Yeah. But it's all prophesied in the Word of God. So the time is at hand. You need to be ready to meet him in the air. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, we're going to take up the offering right now. And if I can get a couple ushers. We want to make sure we give into the kingdom. You know, the, the men are going to be doing some work this Saturday here. And uh, working on plumbing and some other things. So we need some extra help financially if you can do it. Because uh, we want to make sure we get everything just right with the plumber that we got coming and all. And I'm praying. I'm praying for God to give us wisdom. Amen. We all need wisdom. Amen. To know how to do things for the church. You say, well, I don't know how to do much. Well, if you're able, and you've got two hands, and you can come out, come out and help us. Amen? Come out this Saturday. The men are going to be here working, uh, and Pastor will probably say a little bit more about that. But let's give as giving unto the Lord right now. I'm going to ask Brother Rick if he can pray. Father, we do want to thank you, Lord, for your goodness and your sweet mercies, Lord, that we experience every day. And Lord, I, I'm trusting you to meet my needs, Lord, and we're trusting you to meet the needs of this church, Lord. Oh, Father, you've never failed us yet. So, Father, I just pray that we'll be as faithful to you, Lord, as you have been to us. Pray that you bless this uh, offering, these gifts, these tithes, Lord, and that you will just use them to glorify and exalt the precious name of Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Well, we got a couple people here that are going to sing special songs for us tonight. I'm going to ask Sister Reba. She'll come up first.
Some of our songs, we, we've got them in uh, double low. Come on, <laughs> Some of you don't agree with me. I'm going to ask you to stand and, and sing with me one more time. All right, evidently I didn't get the right page number. Two sixty-eight. And why is this my hearing's getting worse? I just think she's talking softer. <laughs> now, at PYFC, they had a group of them that got up and started singing this song. And when they started singing it, they act like that they were on a battlefield. And I'm telling you, whenever they got to singing this thing, the Holy Ghost got to move it. I think that we've got used to coming to church and coasting. I think we've got used to coming to church and if God moves, fine. If He don't move, let's go home. Maybe there'll be another time. Instead of fighting, pushing those forces back. Dustin called me just before the service and he, and he said, Daddy, he said, what about over here in the book of Daniel? And he said, where that Gabriel speaking to Daniel and he tells him, he said, God heard you the first time that you prayed. He said, but I was withstood by the Prince of Persia. The power in the air that was coming against the hindrance of an answer to a prayer. But Daniel did not give up. Church, we're on a battlefield. We are on a battlefield. And I want you to open up and I want you to let her fly. Gloria, come on back up here with us. I want you to act Pentecostal tonight whether you are or not. Can you do that? Don't get offended with me. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yeah. We're on the battlefield, but we're going to win. I'm not Brother Rick. I believe the coming of the Lord's getting closer and closer. And we just need to get in here. Get ready to get out of this world. I was the lone in I go. I was a sinner too. I heard a voice from heaven say there is work to do. I took my master's hand, I joined that heavenly man, now I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I would serve him till I die, now I'm on the battlefield. How many of you are on the battlefield? 
feel. We're getting closer and closer home, aren't we? I was alone and I know I said this in my head. I'm taking it to Jesus, storing the glory land. In this land I try to consider coming up. Now I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. laid this message upon our heart upon my heart. I, I want to talk to you tonight about revival for survival. Yes. The thoughts just been going over in my mind today. Revive us again, oh Lord. Right. Revive us again. I think about the church in the book of Revelation is the word that he said that you have a name that you're alive, but yet you're dead. I don't want that. I don't want us to go through the motions. No. Pentecostal people have learned how to do it. But the thing is, there's a lot of substitutions today. We've substituted learning how to sway with the music to really dancing in the presence of the Lord. Come on. And I want a move of God. I, I like seeing a move of God to where that somebody's up underneath the Spirit and they can't control themselves. Somebody say, oh, that's scary. No, that's exciting. Amen. I, I'm talking about... I. I, I've been in the places where that the Holy Ghost began to speak and there was no controlling. I mean, he just prayed through you. He witnessed through you. And it was just overwhelming. There was nothing like being in a real move of God. Not a generic move. I'm talking about a real move of God. And I want Samoset to experience that again. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 1. It came to pass... That when said Balak heard that we built the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria 
and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Do you hear how he's trying to discourage them? Do you hear how he's trying to tell them your work is in vain, your labor is in vain, you're not going to prosper, you'll never have it like you used to. And I thank God because Nehemiah said, I'm not listening to you. God said, rebuild the walls. And we are going to rebuild the walls. Father, if you've ever anointed this vessel of clay, I'm asking you, God, to anoint it today. I know that God Dustin's preaching tonight and I ask you to God to anoint him. That God, our churches need a special anointing of God that's going to bring a great spiritual awakening. God, I'm praying that we will sense the need of revival in our personal lives. No matter how great of a Christian we feel that we are, God, we're not as close to you as what we could be. And I am praying tonight, Lord, that you will stir up our hearts and stir our spirit. God, let there be an awakening take place in this church. And Father in heaven, I fail not to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be reseated. I want revival. How about you? I want revival. You know, We've come to a place to where that international crises are common. Uh, in fact, I, I started thinking today, you know, crises in this world are just as common as the sun coming up and the sun setting anymore. And it's just, every time that you listen to the news, it's, it's something, something else. We're living in the times where that I feel like that no generation has ever faced a more sobering time than these that we see the prophecies of God's word being fulfilled before our eyes. Right. We hear it. We've been told all of our lives that Jesus Christ is coming. And now we're seeing the fulfilling of the scripture. But the scary part is in the last days, the Bible said there's going to be a falling away. Now, I believe that people have been rocked asleep spiritually to where that we really cannot see how close we are to that midnight hour, to the Son of Man coming. It used to be whenever you preached on the rapture, it literally stirred people's heart. I'm talking about it, 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 it would bring kind of a, a, a stirring where that it made you want to pray more and just make sure but I ask you tonight, whenever you hear a message on the rapture, does it really stir you? Does it really motivate you? Does it excite you? What's going on? And I believe that what we need to do one more time is ask God to send us a revival. Amen. Paul warned us of these times in 2 Timothy 3 and 1. And he said, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. We are living in those perilous times. We're living there. Yeah. But yet we just see it as an everyday event. When we're not focusing upon the fulfillment of God's word. We're just saying, well, it is happening right now. And it's amazing as you study history how that some of our former presidents and leaders could see things. And I believe that God was opening up their eyes, but who wants to go back to those old men? They're dead, they're gone. They cannot relate to the time that we're in. The president, Woodrow Wilson, made this statement and said, our civilization cannot survive materially unless it is redeemed spiritually. Yeah. And I'm telling you that America, England, France, Russia, any nation you want to name, I'm telling you that they're not going to be able to survive materially unless there is a spiritual redemption that takes place. 
We don't have it figured out. We need revival. Amen. We need something that is going to turn the church back to God. How can we expect God to give us a harvest whenever the church needs to be revived? I hear pastors talking about that our, our church is like a hospital where then there's the sick taking care of the sick. And it should not be that way. And I'm not trying to be mean or hard. I'm just going to preach to you what God has laid upon my heart. We must have revival yeah. in order to survive. And especially the things that are coming up on this world. Raymond Hughes has already went on to be with the Lord, but another man of great spiritual insight printed these words and said, Here and there, there are localized and sporadic outpourings of the Spirit. But the mo for the most part, Americans are playing church, honoring God with their lips. And are Christians in name only? Come on. God help us. You may say, preacher, I, I don't believe that stuff. You can take it for what it's worth. I shared with some the other day of, of my cousin that sat down with my sister and was talking about the church where that he attended and how distraught he was over things. And he said, I go there. And he said, they want me to give them money. And he said, they've not done anything for me. And I, I, I know I get that from people. But the second thing was what is so disturbing. He said, I sit in the bar room with him on Saturday night. And he gets up and preaches to me on Sunday morning. And I want to tell you that it tells us that we need revival. But we're not living in a time of separation from this world. But a true revival will bring a separation from this world. And a true revival will cause a change and a repentance to come in this world. But I think about the word of God again. How that he said that judgment must first begin at the house of God. What's going to happen when God begins to judge the church? What's going to happen when God begins to judge people? Has they have called themselves Christians. As I begin to look back, and I know that many of you have, upon the history of this world, we know the only reason why the judgment of God has not annihilated this world is because whenever the world has been at its worst, God has had a group of people that grabbed a hold to the horns of the altar and refused to turn loose of it until there was a revival that really took place. Now let me tell you, a real revival with a real move of God, it's going to bring a real change in people's hearts and lives. Come on. They will not be going through just the form of going to church and looking for a happy message, but they're going to look for the truth in God's Word and ask God to stir them, ask God to convict them, ask God to challenge them to where they can get closer and closer to God. And whenever they begin to realize that the only way that the world was going to survive, their families were going to survive, they realized that we need a revival. So what did they do? Did they not grab a hold to the horns of the altar and they would pray and they would fast and they would seek the face of God and they would pray and they would fast and they would declare the word of God and they would pray and they would fast and they would cry out and say, forgive me, oh God. They would pray and they would fast and they would say, God, forgive our nation. Our nation is full of idolatries and abominations and immorality is running rampant. Oh God, forgive us. In the midst of true revival, people begin to see sin as sin instead of a casual way of adapting to a way of living. Now I know that this is not going to be real popular tonight, but it is a message I feel like that God is burning in my heart. 
We need a revival that is going to bring in change in us before it can bring a change in the community. It's got to bring a change into the church before it can change the people out there that are bound by the chains of sin. Oh God, will you please help us as these people begin to pray and seek God. God begin to birth revival in them. God birth revival in their homes. God birth revival in their churches. And then revival broke out in their communities. Revival broke out in the workplace. And God began to manifest himself. When the people humble themselves for a real move of God. Amen. A real move of God. I know that in the next few weeks, that, you know, we're talking about having revival. Brother Darrell Turner is coming. But I want to tell you that our definition of revival today has changed from what it was back in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Amen. 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 Yeah. Our definition of revival today is just give us a few nights where a, a different preacher comes in and, and, and he preaches to us and maybe somebody's touched and maybe somebody's saved. Them. But true revival is a time whenever the church falls upon their knees and they humble themselves before God. Uh, and they're not reminding God how good they are. And they're not reminding God how righteous they are. Uh, and they're not comparing themselves to the world. Uh, and saying, God, I'm better than they are. But they are honestly accepting the fact uh, that our righteousness is as filthy rags. Uh, and we need the redemption. And we need the blood. And we need the cleansing to be continually upon our life. Uh, Church, listen to me. This is not a one-time experience. If you think I can go and pray one time and everything from here on out is going to be all right, no. This is a daily walk with God. And for the lack of revival, that's where the church world has gone. Oh, but Brother Sprout, I come to church on Sundays, but God wants you on Monday. And God wants you all week long. He wants you to be prayed up on Saturday so that way when you come back to church on Sunday, then you don't have no problems with lifting up your hands unto God because you've been in the presence of God throughout the week. We need a revival that brings a change to us. Ray Hughes said this, revival is God's people getting thoroughly right with God. Wait, I thought revival is about getting sinners saved. That is an evangelistical outreach. That's been evangelistical reaching out to the lost. But every time there's been true revival, revival has had to be birthed in the church where the church becomes God-centered again and whenever the church gets into the right condition spiritually, then God begins to bring the harvest in. Amen. Amen. If you will just allow me to reminisce for a moment. I still remember back in 78, 79, we were at Fort Meade and God got to moving. We were God got to moving in the church. I'm telling you, people began to pray. People began to seek the face of God. People began to want to go to church. Come on. Right. Right. Come on. Yeah. People were excited about going to church. And whenever that started taking place, then the sinners saw the difference in the Christians and started coming. In a six-week revival, there were a hundred people that stood up and said, I gave my heart and my life to Jesus Christ. But it was because that the church was experiencing revival and because of that revival, then they became evangelistic. And God help us to understand that no matter how many times and how much that we try to, to reach the lost, and that's what we're supposed to be doing. I know I've been pounding the Great Commission. We've got to fulfill the Great Commission. But we're, we're going out powerless unless we have a divine move of God and revival breaks out in the church. Oh God, will you please help us, help us, Lord. One writer wrote this and said, when revival comes, the church will no longer be a mere convenience. Just go to church at your convenience. 
When real revival comes, the church will no longer be mere convenience. And religion will not be a sideline, but old time religion will be life. You will enjoy serving God to such an extent uh, that your ears are closed to the siren voice of this world. Your eyes are closed to the allurements of sin and your heart is set on things above and not on things of this earth. Uh, you will hate sin uh, and love holiness. Uh, God's house will seem more important uh, than the rival places of recreation and pleasure. Amen. And we're afraid to preach that anymore. We're afraid to preach that. I believe that we have moved past the saying there is a need for revival to where that the church must see that revival is demanded if we're going to have Pentecostal holiness survival. We've got to have revival. It's not debatable whether or not we're going to have to have, have, to have a move of God I believe that we've come to the place where that the church ought to be or to be crying out to God and saying, God, if we're not, if we're not going to have a move of God, then we're not going to survive the coming storms. And I know right now you're feeling them out here in the world, but church, it's headed on the inside of the four walls of this building right here. It will be because that we have a move of God. And we experience true revival in our personal lives, in our homes, in our churches, in our communities. And it will be that revival that will cause us to survive the storm. And it will be that revival that will bring not only spiritual growth, but numerical growth. You know why? Because people are wanting to feel the true presence of God. They're not just wanting somebody to tell them about what God can do. They want to see what God can do. God help us. I've shared this with some of you that not too long ago, right over here in the church not too far from us, there was a great uproar because of a transgender that was in the church. And he declares that he is a woman. And he decided he is going to use the ladies' restroom. And they told him he was not going to do it. And because of that, he just went irate. They ended up having the police to come in and remove him out of the church. He was disrupting the service. Friend, listen to me. We may think, well, that will never happen to us. But you don't know what's going to happen in the service Sunday. And can I tell you that whenever God begins to move, and I'm talking about a real move of God, you know what the Holy Ghost will do? Brother, it will start revealing the inner man of people that have come and sat on their pew and they have felt comfortable living in their sin. But when a revival fire begins to burn, then conviction is going to start burning. And whenever conviction starts burning, then people are going to get miserable because they've been living such a loose, sinful life and, and, and they've not been acknowledging God. And so conviction is going to get a hold of them. And when I found out people who get up and meet conviction, they'll either get down in an altar and pray through, or else they're going to get mad and show themselves. Amen. Yeah. God help us. The depth of a revival is determined by the depth of our repentance. That's right. And so I, I'm going to say something right here. I'm not trying to offend nobody. We've got too many people that's coming to church and they never see a need to repent. Amen. Now, now hold on. If I was going to do a Brother Hanks right now, this would be a good time to get down behind the pulpit. Because we've got a lot of church people that need to repent. Right. Amen. Amen. We, we, we've got a lot of church people who have not repented over unbridled tongues. I'm not talking about just talking about other people. I'm talking about the words that come out of their mouth. They say that they're a Christian. And many of them have gone as far as to curse the holy name of God. And they see no need for repentance. Come on, church. Help me out tonight. I, I'm telling you that we are living in a time where that people need to start praying and asking God, show me what I need to repent of. Oh, now you're coming up with a strange doctrine here, aren't you? I'm telling you, the closer you get to God, 
the more that God is going to take you to a place to where that you're praying, God, purge me. God, cleanse me. Get less of self out of the way to where I can have more of God inside of me. If God had not done a complete annihilation of Saul, he would have never been the man of God that we call Paul. But it's because that he even wrote this thing. And we want to preach it. We want to sing it. We want to talk about it. But the apostle Paul said, I die daily that Christ may live. When true revival comes, uh, the church is going to go back to dying daily to the things of this world. And they're going to start uplifting God daily in their lives. So they're going to have a more of a greater hunger for God than what they are pleasure and than what they are recreation. And listen to me. You get to the place to where that you want to come to church. Some of you look at me like I'm crazy, but you know getting well, sometimes you don't want to come. You come out of obligation. I want her if I miss. That should tell you what's going on on the inside. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We should be excited. We should have a walk to. Some people are using this excuse. Pastor, my family really don't want to they don't see the need for revival. They really don't want revival. Then let me tell you what you have to do. You've got to get along with God until revival starts burning inside of you so your family can see the need for revival in them. That's right. Amen. Amen. God, please help me. Please help me. You, you don't know how I'm struggling with some of this stuff right now. Friend, I, I'm not trying to offend anybody, but we have really come to this place. To where that the church world is saying, do as I tell you and not as I do. Yeah. We can tell them you've got to pray. But how much praying are we doing? We tell them you've got to sacrifice to serve God. But how much sacrificing are we doing? We have the, the remedy. We have the recipe. But we don't want to do it ourselves. Help us, Holy Ghost. Amen. Oh, God, help us. I really believe that whenever revival really starts burning inside of us, we're going to, we'll are gonna get to the place to where that we stop worrying about who is and who is not. We're going to get to the place to where that it doesn't bother us if people talk about us. It will not bother you if they like you or if they hate you. Are you ready for this? I'm, I'm just preaching what God said on my heart. Yeah. It'll bring you to the place to where that those people who have hurt you, you have truly forgiven them and you're not holding it against them any longer. Amen. That's a real revival. That's right. yeah. how, how many of you remember the revivals when our church people used to get up and start confessing? Yes. You remember that? Sometimes I'll tell you it got scary. It did. They start looking over and saying, hey, if I've said anything to offend you, I am so sorry. I want you to forgive me. Yes, yes. Anybody remember those days? Amen. You remember the days whenever, whenever people got up under such conviction they've been talking about somebody and they went to them and said, look, I shouldn't have been doing it. I, I've been talking about you and I want you to forgive me because I want God to forgive me. Amen. Help us, Holy Ghost. Amen. Do you know what revival will really do? Yeah. It'll not only make you start confessing, it'll start making you do restitution. Right. Do we really want revival? Do we really want revival? Do we want God to bring that change in our life? Amen. You say, preacher, we need to press forward. But sometimes you cannot press forward until you go back. And you say, oh God, here I am, touch me. I think about the children of Israel. Because whenever God began to convict them for marrying wives from a strange country, you know what they did? They said, God, we're going to make it right. And we're going to send them home. Yeah. Amen. Man, that's tough. That is tough. Oh, Lord, you really got quiet on me. Preach it. Come on, brother. But a true move of God will cause us to lay aside all of our petty little stuff that gets us upset over nothing. And we start saying, I'm not going to let anything stop me 
from getting close to God and having a move of God in my life. I think some of you are wishing right now, preacher, why don't you just be quiet and go home? Don't you know it's already after 8 o'clock? <laughs> but listen to me. You, you, you've got people today that say they want a move of God in their life, but they keep seeing the little mouse that runs up underneath the chair instead of keeping their eyes upon the king on the throne. Come on. They, 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 the, the cockroach that got past the, the, the insecticide and got inside, and though he may be staggering and he's dying, he gets more attention than God does. It's easier for us to get more focused upon little things than to keep our attention upon the king. But whenever revival really strikes inside of us, guess what? We're going to be more focused upon God. And somebody will say, well, did you see what happened tonight? No, I didn't. God, let me get caught up in the spirit to where nothing distracts me. I want to be used of God. And can I just remind you that if the devil can find a little pet peeve that's going to stir you up, and you're not going to get breakthrough over it. He's going to use that little pet peeve to stir you up all the time. But if you can pray the word that you have a revival in your heart. And those little pet peeves don't bother you anymore. And so the devil quits trying to aggravate you. Amen. You know, sometimes I watch the kids. And kids are so amazing. But, I, but can I just tell you that kids are just little adults. Amen. Amen. I really love the part. Papa, they're looking at me. I don't want them looking at me. Really? You look at each other all the time. Lord, I must be plowing some ground. And yet, adults come to church. I didn't like the way they looked at me. Come on. Amen. Amen. You know, there's sometimes people don't smile at me. I just figure they've had a bad hair day. That's right. And I realize some people, the, the devil has just rode them all day long, but I don't have to take it personal. I, I tried to tell some of our workers that have come back to him and said, Brother Spiller, this happened and that happened. I said, sometimes you have to be able to let it be like water on a duck's back. You cannot take it personal. That's what the devil wants you to do. Right? They didn't smile at me today. And on the other hand, she smiled at me and she's flirting. My Lord, sometimes it's better to wear a mask. And then everybody's going to accuse you of something else. Whenever you get prayed through, the petty stuff leaves your life. Amen. Can I tell you, it's a whole lot easier to preach this when I was an evangelist. I could preach it and go on and let the pastor deal with it, but guess what? I've got to deal with it. Oh, God, help us. Help us. Help us, God. Help us. Lord, please help us. God, help us to get to the place that the devil cannot antagonize us because it would been prayed through. Now, that's the introduction. Let me tell you, as we look back, and the rest of the message is not going to be as long as the introduction, okay? So that way you don't get scared. I, I want you to look back at the story. I want you to look back at verse number two, where that says, Ballad is beginning to speak, and he's saying this so everybody can hear. What do these feeble Jews? He's asking, what are these feeble Jews doing? And I want you to notice how that he is using his wording in here because it's almost like that he's trying to antagonize them. And 
He is mocking them. Oh, God, help me. Please help me, God. Please, God, God, touch me. Today, as I was preparing this, I'm telling you, it's just like the Spirit of God just began to just deal with my heart. And you, and you may think I'm hard tonight. I'm not trying to be hard. These people were enduring mockings. They had somebody making fun of them. They were calling weak. They were, they were calling feeble. And all of this stuff. And I, I started thinking how that people today get offended if somebody begins to mock them. But you know what really gripped my heart? The church used to be mocked. But you don't hear too many people mocking us anymore. They, make, they used to make fun of the way that we worship God. But the church has become so user friendly. And we are so afraid of offending people. Until the people the sinners, the ungodly come in and feel comfortable. And our way of worship does not offend them. That disturbs me. That disturbs me. Now, I look back at these people who were, they're being criticized, they're, they're being mocked. They were being real. And God help us because that we need to go back to being real. Amen. They, they were experiencing revival. And in this revival, they were rebuilding the place God chose to dwell. And as I begin to look at this, I begin to think, do we not need to be rebuilding the place where God wants to come and sit. We need to rebuild the value of the house of God again. Amen. To where going to church means something. Right. It's a value to us. Yep. We, we need to rebuild the church. And now in the New Testament, he says that you are the temple right. of the Lord. We be reminding in our temple where that God, the holy God, comes and sits and dwells. And I, I started looking because whenever you start talking about building the, the walls, and, and if you start talking about rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem, Jerusalem means the fountain of peace. But whenever you looked at the city, it did not look like a place of peace. The peace of God was gone from it. The city had been destroyed. And people couldn't see the city as any type of peace. All that they could see was mass destruction. In fact, it didn't look like a peace in it at all. It looked like hell had walked into it with all of its demons. And they had been partying there for centuries and decades, uh, and it looks like it has no thing uh, to, to reveal God, nothing that looks like God. Uh, and, and, and I started thinking, you know what? Uh, maybe our churches need to understand that God still has peace that he wants to put in us as individuals, uh, and God has a peace that he wants to put into the church. Uh, and God cannot put peace in where there's bitterness and there is strife uh, and there's envy and there's hatred and there's jealousy. Peace cannot abide there. But in a real revival, the, the Holy Ghost fire will burn out all of those things that is keeping the peace of God out. Uh, my Lord, help us. Uh, I know whenever you look at the walls, uh, the Bible tells us that the walls have been broken and the walls have been burned. Could it be symbolic uh, that we need to be broken and the Holy Ghost needs to burn again in the house of God, in our hearts and in our lives? Uh, some of you need to experience revival. Some of you have never really experienced revival. Uh, you, you've seen everybody else go through the motions and 
and, and even experience some Holy Ghost chill bumps. But I'm talking about a move of God that's so sobering uh, until you don't feel like shouting. Uh, the only thing you feel like doing is laying on your face before the Almighty God uh, and say, my God, uh, wake me, stir me. Uh, do anything that you want to within me. But I want to know you. I want to know you. So you, you, you can understand where that God wants us to have. And Nehemiah, he's trying to tell the people that this city can have peace in it again. And whenever revival starts to come, there's going to be some sin balance that's going to stand up and they're going to try to discourage you. They're going to call you feeble. What does that word feeble mean? It means frail. It means miserable. It means powerless. It means withered or weak. And the devil's trying to tell the church today how frail we are. He's trying to tell us how weak we are, how miserable, how powerless, how withered, uh, and how weak. Uh, and you know, when I come to that part, withered, uh, and all I can see is something like a raisin or like a prune uh, that is just shriveled up. Uh, and, and the devil's trying to tell the church today that's all you are. You, you're just something that all of the good stuff uh, has just been taken out of you, uh, and, and you're all shriveled up. Uh, but honey, I'm going to tell you, we don't have to stay that way because we can pray for revival and God can energize the church. God can set the church back on fire and we can have a move of God to where that we are fruitful and we are prospering spiritually for God. Amen. My God, help us. You may feel like tonight that you're one of the feeble ones, but you don't listen to that sand ballot. You tell that sand ballot in your life that God is going to send you a revival and you're going to have the greatest survival rate that you've ever had. I think about Zechariah 4 and 6 where that he said, um, this is a word of the Lord that is a rubble. It's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Amen. Then the second thing is, will they fortify themselves? St. Ballot had ridiculed the Jews' hope of protecting themselves by rebuilding strong walls. How can you go back and build strong walls? If the devil can cause you to lose hope, then he has you right where he wants you. But while the devil is trying to steal your hope, the Holy Ghost is saying, hang on to your hope and know that revival for survival is yours if you'll just keep building the walls. Now you may look and say, preacher, I don't have walls like Nehemiah. The Holy Ghost began to deal with my heart and said that the church needs to go back and build walls of, of prayer. We need to build walls of prayer. There's no revival that has ever come without prayer. You're not going to have personal revival in your life until you pray. God get us past these little five minute prayers. The word that we pray two or three minutes and feel like, oh God, I've done you a favor. I've been in your presence today. Oh, God, no. I started thinking, God, if the wall has a crack in it, then let us stuff prayer all of that crack. If that wall has a hole in it, then let us fill that hole up with prayer. Let us go back and rebuild the walls of prayer. Let us pray more sincerely. Let us pray with all of our heart. Let us pray openly to receive from God. Let us pray uh, in, in repentance. Uh, let us pray seeking the righteousness of God instead of self-righteousness. Uh, let us pray that we may be humbled in the presence uh, of an almighty God. Because I'm telling you that our fortification is not in the four walls of this church. Uh, it's not even in a congregation because there's congregations that have risen to the thousands of uh, and now the churches look like ghost sinners where hardly nobody comes. I'm telling you, the fortification of a church is a genuine moving power of an almighty God. It cannot be built upon the charisma of a man. It cannot be built upon the personality of a pastor. The true church must be built in the fire of the Holy Ghost and fueled by the blood, the redemption of the Lord Jesus Christ. God help us. And then he said, will they sacrifice? 
Zimbalat tried to discourage their worship and tried to discourage them from serving God. That's exactly what the devil is trying to keep us from doing is worshiping and serving God. Our worship is intensified by our relationship with God. Okay? If we're going to have deep worship, it's going to come from deep relationship with God. Now, if you just want to go through the motion, we can do that. I can get them to speed up the songs. That's fine with me. Man, we can do it like auctioneers. Woo! But that's not where it's at. That's not where You can see there's power in the blood. And the sinner feels that. The convicted power. They sing about the old rugged cross and the tears begin to flow because it's almost like that you're reliving the time whenever Jesus died for every one of us. And so if the devil says, if I can take away the true worship, if I can take away that, that true relationship, and if I can take away that, that, that true serving God, he said that that's what I need to do. Will you have anything in your life right now that God cannot deal with you over? Will you have anything in your life right now that God wants to talk to you about? Some of us are afraid to ask God that. Everything they had had to be dedicated to God. And but yet, everything they had laid in ruins. And so now, I was trying to tell them, look, you don't even have the right place to worship God. Well, then we're going to build it. We're going to revive this. How can you worship when all is destroyed? Then we're going to rebuild and we're going to rededicate. We're going to start serving God. We're going to start worshiping God. And Nehemiah knew the secret to this. When the enemy was criticizing us, he and the church just kept building the walls uh, and the walls of godly relationship, the walls of dedication, uh, the walls of consecration, uh, the walls of prayer, the walls of commitment. Uh, and they were saying, God, uh, God, we are going to serve you no matter what. Uh, we're going to place another brick in the wall. We're going to put another piece of timber in it. Uh, and God was honoring all of their commitment. God was honoring all of their dedication. Uh, God was honoring what they were doing because God can see it come from the heart. Friend, listen to me. We need to serve God from the heart. Yeah. Oh, God, please help us tonight. And then I'm going to try and close. Come on, Sister Spratlin. I know some of you think I've already preached way too long. Well, when we have real revival... We can take the clock off the wall. I want you to listen to this question. Will they revive the stones? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish which are burned? That word revive means will they cause to live again? Will there be a restoration to life? Will there be a rebuilding? Will there be a restoration to well-being? So he is saying will they revive the stones out of the heap of rubbish? That word rubbish means the broken and imperfect pieces. How can you build a wall out of broken and imperfect pieces? And, and then he not only talked about the rubbish, he said, but they're also burnt. Well, St. Ballot was saying, are you going to take that broken and perfect burnt piece and rebuild the wall? Do you expect that wall then to be your fortification, do you expect it to be strong enough to protect you? And then I thought about Ezekiel. 37 and 3. Remember, the Lord asked Ezekiel, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, Oh Lord God, thou knowest. There's no marrow left. There's no flesh and there's no sign of it. But God, if you say these bones that are dry and brittle, and torn apart, you say they can live again, God, they're going to live again. Yeah. 
That's revival. Yes. That's revival. Church, we're not going too far. Amen. We can have revival. Yes. We can have revival. And then I think about what Peter said in 1 Peter 1 and 7. He said that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the period of Jesus Christ. Listen to me. That fire that is purging, God began to take the broken, burn rubble. And God began to allow them to take that which the devil had tried to destroy and said you'll never be able to use it again. There's a lot of people today that's looking for new ways to have revival. And they're thinking maybe if we can get the right kind of music, if we can get the, the right type of motivator, maybe, maybe just what we really need to do just to make this thing easy are you, are you listening to me tonight? Yeah. Why don't we just change the definition of revival? Why don't we just change the definition of revival to say if, if you have three or four nights, you can call it revival. No, friend, we cannot cheapen this. We cannot, we cannot break down the standard of what a true revival is. Because the true revival must start in the church and it brings about a change in every one of our hearts. No matter how close you think you are to God tonight, I'm not belittling you. I'm not putting you down. I'm preaching to myself. I can get closer. But I am not going to see how close I can get to God until I humble myself back down and I begin to cry out unto Him and say, God, take me to the next level. Burning me revival fire, God burning me revival fire so a lot of people just want to change the definition but how can we change the definition if you've already experienced a real move of God you know that nothing else will work has the walls has the walls did not stand back up by their self but the workers begin to put the broken pieces back in their place and God is the one that began to seal it all back together those those gates, some of them might have had pieces of wood they could not use again. But they began to build gates again. And it was men that began to raise those gates back up. But it was God that caused them to be strong gates yeah. that the devil could not penetrate. And I'm telling you, if we'll go to work, and I'm not talking about reaching people on the outside of the church tonight, I'm, I'm preaching to the church. If we'll go to work and say, God, let revival start right here in me. Burn in my heart, Holy Ghost. Burn. God, I want you to burn hotter than you've ever burned. I want you, to, God, to do a work in me that you've never done. And we go back and we pray until we get hungry for God again. We pray until that we start desiring to see a fresh move of God and new things that God is wanting to do. Church, it'll happen. China is experiencing revival because people over there are saying, hey, all we want is God. All we want is God. There, there's a lot of the Hispanic countries that are experiencing revival today. And you know why? Because a lot of them are saying, we don't have anything else but God. But whenever you come to America, we have too many things to occupy our mind. One Hispanic group in North Florida, told Brother Hanks this. He said, it's much harder to serve God in America than what it is back in our homeland. He said, because you have so much going on here in America, and we don't in our homeland. You, listen to me. We, we are bombarded by the very presence of the demonic powers of hell, and we don't realize how we're being distracted and how that the devil is making us so busy until we don't have time to really search and seek after God. But I'm telling you, if we will discipline ourselves to say, God, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to seek your faith. So, God, I'm going to fast. So, I'm going to cry out unto you. I'm telling you, God will show up in your life, and God will do things for you, and God will make ways where there is no way. I believe that God will perform healings and miracles, so, and there will be a manifestation of God that no man can do, uh, because man cannot do it, but the power of God flowing through men can do it. 
I'm going to close with this passage of Scripture. In Jeremiah 6 and 16, he said, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. We've got to go back to prayer. It's out of our brokenness of life that God's going to take it and make a vessel of honor. He's going to forge us through the fire, but we'll be a vessel of honor. God wants to take what's been broken and He wants to create a revival for our survival. Will you stand with me? I'm not going to give it a long, lengthy altar call. I just want... I want you tonight, if you really want God to send revival, and you're willing to put yourself on that, upon that altar as a sacrifice and say, God, let revival start right here in me. I, I'm part of this church, but the four walls is not the church, but God people are. You really want God to send revival in you, find you a place to pray. Come on, find you a place to pray. God, tonight, let tonight be that night, God, that we just get so hungry for you. So hungry for a move of God. So hungry. So hungry for revival. So hungry for revival, God. Hungry, God.
Oh.